So today we've got an extra special lunchtime lecture. We have um, Dr. Mark Nelson and Sir Ian Prance talking today about lessons learned from Biosphere 2, the world's first experimental laboratory for global ecology. So I'm going to introduce Sir Ian Prance first, and then he'll speak, and then Sir Ian will introduce Mark afterwards. So Sir Ian Prance, who um, is the past president of the society here, he was president between 1997 and 2000. He has conducted 39 expeditions to study the Amazon flora, and is a former director of the Royal Botanical Gardens Kew. So Sir Ian, would you like to come up? Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and it's always good to be in the Linnaean Society. As you heard, I was president, and I know one of the things we did while I was was get Alfred Russell Wallace up beside Darwin, because uh, <laughs> uh, we needed to give him a place. Right, we're going to talk about Biosphere 2. Between uh, Tucson and uh, Phoenix is Oracle, Arizona. and. Uh, it is here that uh, one of the great experiments, I'm just going to see, oh, maybe I can do it on the computer, right. One of the uh, great experiments of all time took place, the building of Biosphere 2. Here are some statistics about it. I had been working to various conferences with the Institute of Ecotechnics and so they knew my interest in the rainforests and their preservation. And so this is divided into various biomes. And so I was asked to help design the rainforest. That was really exciting invitation. And uh, I had met Mark Nelson quite a while before that at the various conferences. And so Mark is an old friend. And I'm delighted that he's here and we're working together on this. So Mark, as you can see, is on uh, the right-hand side of this photo. And the gentleman in a hat is John Allen, who is uh, really a Renaissance man. And I think he was the uh, instigator behind all this. But not only that, he was the ideas man and stimulated so many of the things that uh, turned out to be Biosphere 2 and always uh, gave us encouragement as... Uh, we worked on, on this. Recently, there have been two books about Biosphere 2. It's 25 years since the people who went in, the first eight people that were in this sealed environment for two years came out. And uh, so it's time to look back a bit on it. And we really, uh, one by John Allen, and the other one is Mark Nelson's book, Pushing Our Limits, and uh, I recommend you read it because it's a very honest book about it. It uh, talks about this visionary project, but it also talks about the things that went <coughs> wrong as well. And it's a scientific experiment, and I think you learn just as much from the things that don't work as do. The press pick up those, of course, and not the good news. Uh, and as I look back on it, I see it has achieved so many things and been used a great deal. So here it is being built. And uh, I, I brought many of my colleagues to Arizona to help me because building this rainforest, I needed various assistance. So here are two of uh, my graduate students who were working with me at New York Botanical Garden. Andrew Henderson, who is uh, an expert on, uh, on palms. And the other one is an expert. Uh, he was doing his thesis on uh, peanuts, on arrakis. And so he was uh, talking about food plants and was uh, very useful with ideas. Because when we built this rainforest, and knowing that eight people were going to be sealed in there for two years, we wanted the rainforest, too, to have one or two things that could be harvested and uh, uh, help because they had a small and very efficient farm that Mark will tell you about. But uh, it was good that there were a few luxuries in the, the, some of the other biomes. And then I had uh, John Lonsdale from Kew there who came out and was uh, a very helpful a member of the Living Collections uh, team at Kew. So I borrowed uh, colleagues, former colleagues at New York and uh, colleagues at Kew, 
uh, as we were putting uh, things together to get the rainforest right. And we had so many different meetings, informal ones, just chatting outside, meetings in the various offices to talk about it. On the uh, uh, extreme right there is uh, uh, the person who uh, designed, was a captain of the uh, savanna biome that was in the in there. It had a savanna, a rainforest, and uh, an ocean, and uh, uh, of course a farm. So here we have uh, some important people to with it. Mark Nelson, uh, who is one of the biospherians, he spent two years shut in there, and this book is about that experience of uh, being there, but it goes far beyond that and puts the whole thing very much into context. And in front here, taking notes about things is Linda Lee. She was one of the other biospherians, and she uh, had good training in botany, and it was with her that uh, I worked a lot on collecting the plants, discussing what to put into the rainforest and the other biomes, and acquiring plants to put it in. So she worked with it for two years before, and so was very well equipped by the time she went into the biosphere. One of the criticisms that the press picked up if you're doing this as a scientific experiment, why haven't you put scientists in there, uh, PhDs? Well, I tell you, if you put eight PhDs together there, it would just not have worked. <laughs> These were generalists who could uh, repair the mechanisms of everything that was in there, who could uh, farm so that uh, they could feed themselves and everything like that. And all of them were remarkable people because between them they had so many skills and they showed that uh, they could create a, a, a biosphere. Well, it was wonderful experience trying to get uh, things into the rainforest. And one of the important things was to make it look a bit like a rainforest right at the start. So I had to think about what grows quickly and start a succession so I use some of the uh, plants that are light demanding in the rainforest that grow up quickly. And I had seen in the, in the north of Argentina a species of phytolacca that grew very, very quickly. Interesting, we think of phytolacca as a herb, but there's a tree species. So I collected some seeds of that and uh, it very soon grew and grew. It was a wonderful thing, giving the aspect of a rainforest. The other thing we tried to do was put in different habitats. There was an area that flooded, uh, emulating the Vasia forest of the Amazon, and there was a mountain emulating the uh, tepuis of uh, the Guyana Highland. And in that, we put uh, various plants, and there was a nice area for the biosphere biospheres to relax up on the top of the tepui. One of the important things is that uh, in each of the biomes, everything was mapped, because this was a scientific experiment to see how things were doing and how they were developing. And so we began with good maps of what was in the rainforest biome. You notice on that chart, everything is numbered, and that corresponded with the database on uh, the uh, plants that we kept, and the biospherians, while they were, were there, recorded a great deal of information about what was going on in there. And you see, on the left-hand side, we tried to produce mist like a cloud forest, make it a real cloud forest, like the tepuis are uh, inside, and that uh, worked reasonably well. Now, one of the things I knew, because I've been working with a project on minimum critical size of ecosystems near to Manaus, Brazil, where we isolated different areas. And the small areas of one hectare or 10 hectares, there was a terribly strong effect coming in from the edge, edge effect, well known in ecology. And so if you've got a small rainforest here, 
I thought of all the light coming in and doing the same sort of thing. So what uh, we did was plant various bananas and members of the Zinji Borelis around there as a light barrier to stop the light coming in. Then over this was the ocean and we didn't want uh, too much influence of the ocean coming into the rainforest, so there we, uh, we built a bamboo curtain. And uh, it, uh, too, worked quite well to uh, keep them apart. So that was all part of uh, designing. There is the ocean, by the way. And in this one, you can see around the edge all these Zinji Borelis. Some of them were just there to shade, Others ornamental, like heliconias, but there were some bananas there, and I hope you harvested some of them, Mark, because uh, that was the idea of, uh, uh, of that belt. Is it Mark Keller or Mr. Keller? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, that's right. Mark will tell you more about that. But look at, it's a magnificent uh, construction with all these biomes in, and it was so exciting to, to uh, be part of it. Look at the work that went into designing and the architecture and all that. And because we were responsible for building a rainforest and the other captains for other things, we talked a lot to the engineers. Uh, we want this. Uh, and very often uh, they wanted something else. But I think uh, on the whole, the biologist won out in getting uh, the designs that they wanted in the different parts. So here it is in the evening, and you see that bulge on the left-hand side. With the changes of temperature between night and day in Arizona, the uh, air inside expands or contracts. And so you have to have an area that uh, can form a lung at the side. So in, the, in fact, it had two of these on it, and that way it coped with this uh, changing volume of the air inside. So all these little items were thought of in the design of it. So that's my association with Biosphere 2. It was wonderful over that time, and I went back to see the biosphere and through the window uh, several times, discussing problems with uh, Linda Lee about plants that were not doing right uh, by telephone, as they did have communication with the outside world, and uh, that sort of thing, so it went on. But it wasn't long be after that that uh, Tim Smith came and saw me and said, would you help with uh, the Eden Project, because I hear you're a rainforest specialist. And so I did. And I tell you, the lessons learned from Biosphere 2 came in so useful for that rainforest at Eden. <coughs> there were different sort of project. Biosphere 2 was sealed so that uh, it was completely, it was almost airtight. The Eden Project was deliberately open to be something for the public to come and learn the importance of plants to people, basically. But as I designed their rainforest, I thought of what worked and what didn't work in Biosphere. We had various problems with the soil, for instance, in Biosphere 2, in the rainforest. And I uh, said to the Eden Project right at the beginning, we must have a soil specialist. And I was like a broken record at all the meetings of planning. We need a soil specialist. And so ultimately they hired Tony Kendall, the soil uh, lecturer at Reading University. And he was invaluable because the soils in all the biomes at Eden work extremely well because they were designed by someone who knew a lot about soils. It was very important that we, we did that. So here is just a view of the rainforest in Eden, learnt from uh, Biosphere 2 and uh, some people enjoying it. The children's program there is extremely important. Well, now, having done those two, I thought I had finished this sort of thing with ambitious, wonderful projects. But no, I am chairman of an NGO called MEMO, Mass Extinction Memorial Observatory, and 
we are taking over some caves in Portland Island that have been carved out to get Portland stone. And we've formed a partnership between the Eden Project and the Stone pro uh, Project. As they take out the stone, we're taking over to have a wonderful exhibit of uh, biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity using stone carvings of extinct species, but also using the most modern projection techniques, laser and things, so that people can get into the rainforest in a three-dimensional way without there being any trees at all. I see how well this works in the Museum for Tomorrow in Rio de Janeiro, so I have no doubt that we can give a wonderful experience on this. So now I'm uh, very busy working on this and currently trying to raise a lot of money to uh, open Eden Project Portland. So that's, uh, you saw a carving in the last one of an extinct species of Cyania, Cyania superba, but uh, it's an important endemic genus to Hawaii. Those are the sorts of things we are trying to do there. So Biosphere 2 has led me into all sorts of things, and many of the people who were involved with Biosphere 2 have applied what they learned in other places. I think that's one of the most important lessons from Biosphere 2. And uh, now we must hear from one of the Biospherians, Mark Nelson. You see his book up here, and uh, I think there are some copies uh, here if you want to get one. I highly recommend it. Mark, after he went through uh, Biosphere 2, uh, did a PhD with the uh, Odom brothers, two of the most famous ecologists you could imagine. So he too, it led him into p pursuing much more than just uh, farming in Australia to a, uh, uh, a career in ecology and particularly in uh, wastewater management too. So Mark, over to you. Slideshows. So, you know, I, I'm glad we have a bit more time because I want to uh, give you kind of the full and the backstory of Biosphere 2 because uh, it's often kind of seen as something that just sort of suddenly happened in the Arizona desert. Uh, but the story is, is quite more complex and interesting than that. So, I want to give you some of the background of the creative team who basically uh, conceived and, and managed and put together the, uh, the project, and also some of the historical scientific traditions that kind of make Biosphere 2 in context more uh, understandable. So I need to start with Institute of Ecotechnics. Uh, and the, the basic uh, story I want to tell you is that Starting in the late 1960s, we formalized the Institute in 73. It's now in the US and the UK. We could see very clearly this very troubling uh, aspect or almost dominant feature of humanity's relationship with the biosphere is that the technologies that we've chosen really don't harmonize with the biosphere. Unintended consequences, you can call it. Did everyone hear it? I, well, I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> so let me walk you through some of the projects. And we started in New Mexico and kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a New York City kid. I went to, to a university in New England. I'd never seen anything as bare and semi-arid or arid as uh, this part of New Mexico. And unfortunately, it was a good illustration. This is actually much worse ecology than it was before first the Spanish, then the, uh, the Anglos came with their cattle and overgrazing and inappropriate farming. So this highly degraded ecology uh, that happened in, in the last century. 
And our goal was to see if we could make an oasis in the desert. And, you know, if you know some of the, the books in ecology, there's been a very powerful story, a very unfortunate story, that civilizations tend to leave deserts in their wake. So we wanted to push the, the envelope and push the ball up the hill, little Sisyphean action. Uh, but to use the best of, you know, as, as Ian was saying, we're not primarily academic scientists, but our starting point was that we know enough about ecology that we can, you know, we can change business as usual if you make the intention that all the technology that you're going to use is appropriate and your goal is both to meet human needs and to upgrade, restore the ecology, the local e ecosystem that you're, you're in. And after about 10 years in New Mexico, the city boy became a practical both farmer and tree planter. We, we, uh, I went to Australia, and we have a project in the Kimberley region. And what was really interesting to me was in the tropical savanna, as opposed to the high desert semi-arid grassland, the same story. <laughs> And even in a quicker time, because the, the Europeans, the Australians, didn't get to a lot of the outback until maybe the late 1880s or so, but devastation ensued. And this land was so poor that the Australian government said, if you can improve it, and they were interested in improving, because this is typical of millions and millions, maybe tens of millions of hectares, we'll sell it to you for $1.60 an acre. But the, the, the catch was we had to figure out how to restore the pastures and uh, upgrade the ecology again. And then over the years, you know, education outreach is really important. This is an interesting area because not only is it very, very remote, uh, 2,500 miles from Perth and 1,500 miles from Darwin, heavily Aboriginal. And so our programs, which were, you know, in general in ecotechnics, our motto is learn by doing. Involving Aboriginal kids with learning to ride horses, take care of cattle. Aboriginal culture has a rich tradition of caring for the land. We actually could get motivation and really good success rates uh, that usually fail uh, with Western educational types and a little view of the pastoral oasis that has ensued. At all our projects, all of these land projects, by the way, we always reserve some of the land to be basically untouched as a long-term control. So that's true in Australia. Then, you know, and, and again, you know, uh, Sir Ian has given you a, a little uh, preview of Biosphere 2. And key to it, uh, and of course, anyone who reads ecology and understands the earth is the building blocks of biospheres are biomes. So the program of the Institute of Ecotechnics, which is a small uh, uh, institute in terms of numbers of people, but with fairly large, ambitious ideas that uh, we, we have great fun in implementing, was that we need to train our people into a representative uh, section of biomes around the world. And we tend to choose ones that conventional approaches, conventional ecological approaches, especially conventional economic approaches, have proved to be inadequate. So uh, we found a, uh, a rainforest project in Puerto Rico. And it was sec it's secondary rainforest. It was heavily logged. It was, you know, most of the land was converted to coffee plantation. And the idea there is sustainable forestry in the rainforest. And so in cooperation with the Puerto Rican government, we planted 40,000 seedlings of valuable native and, and uh, suitable uh, hardwood species with minimal disturbance of the surrounding uh, forest. Uh, so you can sort of see that. We just cut lines through the forest and if they were you know, large and, and valuable native species, we, you know, we left them, we certainly didn't cut them down. And again, you know, the different zones. So all of our work is concentrated on about one third of this property. The, the rest is being left, a lot of steep slopes up in these mountains to see the natural regeneration of the secondary forest. And right now, by the way, I'm sure when I say the word Puerto Rico, you're thinking Hurricane Maria. 
which indeed uh, really damaged our project. But because we have been trying to bring back a, a wood consciousness and wood industry to the island, uh, they're really doing pioneering work, working with uh, both Puerto Rican and FEMA organizations to save the hurricane-filled hardwoods, which otherwise would be chipped and put into landfills. <laughs> so they have saved uh, an enormous amount of the timber, and they're still fighting the fight because uh, vested interest and status quo is, you know, we have a program to spend a lot of money and completely not value these hardwood trees. And then, uh, and we have uh, Judy Hawes, uh, the manager of October Gallery. Institute of Ecotechnics is a modern ecological perspective. And I think, you know, traditionally colleges would uh, go into Chicago and say, well, this is actually an oak hickory biome and kind of ignore that it's been actually made into a multi-million person city. So cities, the world city is, is an anthropogenic biome, but ignoring it is folly because actually what happens in cities drives a huge amount of what the, the impact of human technology on the planet is. So we decided to uh, locate in the beautiful and vibrant city of, of uh, London. And the October Gallery, which was started in the late 70s, took as its mission to be an art gallery with a big difference. It was going to basically uh, search the world for cutting edge artists from, I think, maybe 80 cultures have now shown at the October Gallery, and to get them out of the box of, oh, well, this is very nice, but it, isn't it ethnic art? No, these are cutting edge artists. And largely, I think it's, it's begun to uh, change the art consciousness in, in the city. It's also a place as a view into some of the interior spaces and one of the exhibitions, a place where we wanted to have, and actually uh, uh, we'll get later to the Linnaean Society, Royal Society. It's a meeting place also for art, artists and scientists. And that's been kind of our modus operandi from, from the beginning. Because I think it's also, it's really impoverishing to science and it's impoverishing to artists to keep them separate. It's also unnatural, <laughs> maybe in, inhumane. World ocean. Well, you know, you can't really study the, the planet if you don't have a research ship. And being a pretty low income, very uh, self-funded, largely institute, we decided to do a synergy of a Chinese junk when the Chinese junks were ocean going with a ferrous cement hull and, uh, and decks. And that was a great material when you have 20 or 30 unpaid institute people who can do the labor. Very strong syner synergetic property too. And if you run into reefs, and that tends to happen when you do exploration in poorly charted waters, you send divers down to do an epoxy uh, repair. And uh, over its virtually 40 years of, of exploration, it's actually the 270,000 nautical miles, you can picture it as further than a trip from the Earth to the moon. And it's done including, you know, by the urging of uh, Sir Ian and Richard Evans Schultes, two years in the Amazon doing ethnobotany and many, many uh, expeditions. And also the Mediterranean biome and, you know, this, this Mediterranean, uh, one is a really challenging ecology. This is just outside Aix-en-Provence. And these beautiful mini uh, ecologies, you know, the French have their little wood woodlands so they can shoot uh, pigeons and, and whatnot, is under threat just by uh, suburban uh, development and, and land prices going up. So we made it the conference center, but also there's an occasion for me to tell you that the other major anthropogenic biome is agriculture and ranching. And it occupies a surprising amount of the Earth's surface. And what we do on farms and ranches is a really big part of the, of the story. And uh, Serene was mentioning, we, we first met, I believe, at the Planet Earth Conference. But you know, starting in about 1974, we started to hold these conferences. This is the, the last one we had which was on the Mediterranean uh, in Aix-en-Provence. But it was a place both to educate um, the Institute 
and to kind of network and bring together people at the top of their fields from many cultures and many scientific disciplines and artists and thinkers. And through that process, we actually contact, well, it was also, let me be frank, it was an opportunity to meet our heroes. <laughs> And, and we found that, you know, no honorariums, you know, economy travel, uh, people at the top of the field really want to meet other people at the top of the field and kind of like uh, cross-pollinate, I guess would be the botanical image. And, you know, just one out of many, one of our heroes is Bucky Fuller. This is the 1982 Planet Earth Conference and he's next to Bill Dempster who will want, you know, he did, for example, the lungs that uh, Sir Ian was talking about. He was a system engineer at Biosphere 2. And Bucky was, uh, you know, extremely generous. So, you know, we built domes and several of our projects and there were domes over those lungs. But we, you know, through these conferences, we had the network of people because Biosphere 2 was on a much larger scale than any of the previous, these ecotechnic projects. And let me just, to introduce Biosphere 2, you know, what tended to get the play in the media was, this is a space colony. Now, it is true that that was part of our thinking, but, you know, we're kind of realistic people. You're not gonna launch Biosphere 2 in, in spaceships anytime soon. We're gonna start with the much more simple systems that the space agencies are working with, hydroponics, et cetera. But our contention was if, you know, humanity with Earth life. The really wonderful thing when you get into biospheres is that humans come in, bi in biospheric um, envelopes. You know, you can't really separate a human from a biosphere long. It's extremely expensive, you know, what we do in space right now. But our contention was that if we're gonna actually have a future, a destiny in space, we're gonna learn how to miniature, miniaturize the essential functions of a biosphere. But Biosphere 2 is much more than that. It was partly in influence, you know, when we were kind of conceiving of Biosphere 2, comparative planetology, I hope that's not a, a foreign concept to you, is now really driving a lot of astrogeology. We're learning about the Earth because we're learning more about, you know, why Venus is different, why Mars is different. And now, of course, we're, we're starting to find exoplanets. So our contention was, since we are making an uncontrolled kind of testing to destruction of our global biosphere, we need to start a new discipline, a new type of science called biospherics, comparative biospheres. And I, I kind of alluded to the fact that we have large ambitions. So we named Biosphere 2, uh, Biosphere 2, to invite the question, where is Biosphere 1? Is that something else that you built that didn't work so well? No, Biosphere 1, Biosphere 1 is, is the one and only at the present moment biosphere we know. And we very much envision, and the fat lady hasn't sung, and I think the, 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 the rationale for Biosphere 2 becomes more and more understandable as we progress into the 21st century, is there should be Biosphere 3, 4, 5, 10, 20, and they can be made with different configurations of biomes. The Russians, who we really cooperated heavily with and shared their experience, they were the leaders in bioregenerative life support. They wanted to do one in Russia, and Biosphere 2, we tried to make as clean and non-polluted as possible. They said, no, we'll make, you know, Biosphere 3 in Russia will be highly polluted, and it will be a laboratory where we can study biogenic ways or Phyto, phyto um, cleansing ways of cleaning up air, water, soil pollution. So it can be you know, used in, in many ways. So homage to, uh, here's some of the, the science history that we tapped into. Vladimir Vernatsky, uh, who is still, should be way more known, he, uh, he should be up on these walls in my opinion. He was the Russian who really, he didn't coin the word biosphere, but he really revolutionized the understanding of it. He invented, he started the field of biogeochemistry because as he went around, he started to see the power of life. Is that, you know, we're not, life is not just a passenger. Life has transformed the earth. The earth that we know 
is certainly a, a cosmic phenomena. There's certainly powerful geology, but the, but the impact of life in making our planet more habitable and the, the, the ever um, constant of life is to multiply, to conquer and you know, evolve species that can utilize more matter and spread over the earth. And the other pioneer uh, who, who became an advisor to Biosphere 2 is Claire Folsom. And back in the late 50s, he was, he was the first, and then there was a handful of other people, who started working with laboratory-sized closed systems. And to his surprise, he was a microbiologist, among other things, was his discovery that if he started with sufficient diversity and you know, uh, allowed some external light for, you know, for photosynthesis and control of heat, that these systems would be indefinitely um, surviving, persisting, even changing. So some of his earliest flasks from the early 60s are still going strong. So closed ecological systems. So in Biosphere 2, you know, you kind of get the picture. We understood we needed to have a, a series of biomes, including a micro city, the human habitat, and a farm. But once you make something highly sealed, then you start to think in different ways. I sh should also mention, and, and uh, Sir Ian you know, made very valuably, what the media tended to forget was this was a giant leap into the unknown. This was, in a way, making a new laboratory. We want to study global ecology, both at, at, at several levels of complexity, from the really detailed reductionist type of studies to larger ones. But we actually want to make an experimental facility and set up an experiment. And you know, so there was some, some allegations or whatever that this was hubris that Biosphere 2 is an example that, you know, humans want to control everything. Well, really quite the opposite, and especially I, I speak from the two years of living in there. We were quite cognizant, and all of the, the ecologists would call them the captains of the biomes. You know, they under, you know, ecologists understand. You can set up conditions that are good for life, but, you know, you cannot control life, and there was no intention of doing that. That was one reason that we had such diversity of soils and types of water is to maximize microbial life at every, you know, every level of life as a safety factor. And you know, so our, maybe our first battle with the engineers is they looked at the designs of our architects and said, this is really gonna be difficult and we can save a lot of money if we just make a big box store, I don't know if you have Walmart here, but you have Marks and Spence, et cetera. Uh, and you know, fortunately, the architects and the project managers held their ground and said, you know, if we're if we're you know Looney Tunes enough to think that we can make a mini biosphere, we're going to make something that is really awesome, that's really beautiful, because really, what you know, biosphere two is in in one sense an homage to our global biosphere. I mean, one of, one of our uh, scientists, Tony Burgess, who is the desert captain, has called Bi Biosphere 2 a cathedral to Gaia. And I, li I like that image because, you know, there's a lot of reverence when you deal with, with life systems. And, you know, from the H.T. Odom, who, who uh, helped me with my PhD, he was the father of ecological engineering. He loved emphasizing that the history of evolution, the history of ecology is basically ecological self-organization and you know, manifesting under challenging conditions. So Biosphere 2 could also be seen as the greatest experiment in ecological self-organization. This is, this is kind of interesting. So as I was mentioning, we made a big alliance with the leading Soviet institutes in Moscow and Siberia who had done the pioneering work in you know, human closures and a simplified ecology. And when they visited Biosphere 2, they, they totally um, got what we were doing and they really liked it because they were dealing with, with simpler uh, closed systems and they could see you know, because we were versed in Vernatsky, that in a way Biosphere 2 was taking closed systems to a Vernatsky and a biospheric level. But they said, you've named it wrong. 
it's not biosphere two, it's noosphere one. And how many people have heard of noosphere? Okay. <laughs> not surprising. Uh, as I say, Vernadsky's work is, you know, he's super renowned like, like Darwin and Wallace in, this, in Eastern Europe and, and in Russia. Vernadsky was, was wise enough and, you know, understood the dynamics of the biosphere to see that the conflict, and it was the Vernadsky school that came up with the term technosphere to describe all of the human economic and technological developments, that the technosphere was doing damage to the biosphere, and he thought the next stage in, you know, our collective evolution was the development of a noosphere. And noos comes from the Greek for mind or intelligence. And he was saying, we, we are, you know, humanity is such a geologic force on the planet that we've got to regulate and make sure that our actions don't harm the biospheric system. So that's what noosphere means. And it was very profound for us uh, because as I was saying, once you actually envision an essentially materially sealed system, then that changes your thinking about what's tolerable. So our engineers, this was maybe the second revolt of the engineers, we, we're gonna be asking you to do near impossible things, but there's a basic requirement. Nothing that you suggest, materials, machinery, equipment, that goes into Biosphere 2 can release pollutants that the biosphere can't handle. So we redesigned the technosphere and we further said, you're not number one here. Number one is all the life systems in Biosphere 2. The technosphere's role in Biosphere 2 is only to enhance and support life function because you're making a artificial biosphere, then you have to create winds and water circulation, you have, to, you have to create waves in the ocean. You know, we're, we're excluding a lot of the natural functions of the earth. And I think this is maybe, the, you know, Biosphere 2 perhaps, you know, earned its legacy just in the demonstration that top engineers could get on the program and redesign a technosphere that is really fully compatible with the biosphere. And so, you know, one of the other goals, and we anticipate if you make a really tightly sealed system, you're probably going to be inventing or rediscovering and, and refurbishing eco technologies of value. And one of our dread uh, concerns was if this is so tightly sealed, we're going to have the world's worst sick building syndrome because trace gases are going to build up. And we found uh, a technology that's more used and known in Germany and elsewhere in Europe than in the United States called soil biofiltration. And the idea that, you know, like sewage treatment plants or en engineers with nasty smelling factories, they had the out of the box idea, let's put our exhaust uh, air from that factory through the soil. And lo and behold, the microbes in the soil they look at a pollutant and say, what? Yummy. Oh, yummy, okay. I thought you are giving me a signal like five minutes or something. That's why I have a, 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 a clock here. And we are gonna leave time, uh, inshallah, for, for questions and discussion. Yeah, so they discovered that the microbes, you know, whatever the pollutant are, whatever the trace gases are, there is a type of microbes in general, there's one exception we could get to in discussion, that, that can eat it. So uh, we developed this system. We actually made the entire farm, the, the half acre, fifth of a hectare farm, uh, engineered to be a soil bed reactor, a soil, uh, soil biofilter, because we could pump all of the air up through that soil in 24 hours if we had trace gas buildup. And one of our first design spin-offs is that looks like an ordinary landscape plant in an office. But in fact, it's, it's a soil biofilter and the second chamber near the, near the ground has an air filter so that all the internal air can be pushed up through it. So we have, we have computers here, humans emit trace gases, virtually all life does, certainly all human made materials and machines. And the beautiful thing about a soil biofilter is you don't have to program it. You know, depending on what 
is in the air, a corresponding group of microbes will feast on it. And we've already been on to, to this topic. So, you know, just to give us some bona fides, you know, the eco design of Biosphere 2, you know, was, was looking at lots of uh, complexity. And all of the biome captains, who, you know, I have to say, you know, Sir Ian took on the challenge, but everyone knew it was completely unknown, pretty much, how many species would be lost. So the general strategy was species packing so that hopefully after Biosphere 2 settled down and you know waves of, of losses that we would keep uh, food webs because Biosphere 2 is not a botanic garden. It's basically a living micro earth. So we need food webs to support all the life that we're putting in there. And just a little visual tour so the, you know, some of the surprises of, of the two years was just how much life liked Biosphere 2. We, you know, by logistical necessity, we started with a small one and, and plants grew amazingly. This, this is uh, Sir Ian and his wife and John Allen and myself uh, visiting the rainforest. And the rainforest, you know, one of the great strategies was fast growing first canopy trees. And so we had Cecropia, but we also had Lucina, and these Lucina trees uh, grew from five to, let's say, two to three meters to 10 meters in the first two years. We actually cut and took them out because, uh, you know, this part of the value of, of uh, the rainforest biome in particular was strategies when uh, the rainforest gets cut or chopped into pieces, how to protect both from harsh over, overhead light and side light. The savanna, which included a uh, little billabong stream and vast uh, areas. So I, I should say one of the wonderful things, which is explained at longer length or greater length in, in pushing our limits, was the humans had unique roles. We were the keystone predators. We didn't have herds of animals to graze the savanna. So we would intervene basically to defend biodiversity in our uh, systems. We'll get to this later. We were also the atmospheric stewards, you know, trying to manage uh, the, the uh, very small atmosphere inside. Ocean with, re with a living reef and one of the most amazing systems I totally fell in love with, marsh mangrove biome. We, we took an estuary system from the Everglades that might be 10 or 20 miles long and compressed it into seven zones in about 60 or 70 meters. And the, the uh, desert biome. And this was a, okay, we'll go to the farm. The farm and, uh, you know, the anthropogenic farm. So uh, I've done a lot of organic uh, farming in my life was really interesting in a closed systems, even some of the uh, pesticides and, and control chemicals that are approved organically, we couldn't use because we intended Biosphere 2 to be a 100 year experiment. So anything at even small quantities that would build up in the water, in the soil, the air, you know, was a no no. And Biosphere 2 kind of uh, exemplifies the ecological intens intensification that I think is the 21st century better answer than the Green Revolution. Uh, so what's now becoming current in, in the global biosphere is we need to have farms and ranches that retain their nutrients because nutrient runoff from, from those uh, activities are one of the leading pollutants on the planet. And the great thing about Biosphere 2 was it was such a compact and concentrated life system that uh, cycles, the same cycles, this is why it's a global ecology laboratory, all those lovely, the carbon cycle, the water cycle, nutrient cycles are operating, but they're at you know, far greater paces. So for example, in, in Earth's biosphere, three years is the average time that a CO2 molecule stays in the atmosphere, one to four days in Biosphere 2. That means in one year we have 90 cycles. So as a laboratory, it was both challenging to manage and a storehouse of, of learning. So uh, 
it was called a cyclotron for the life sciences by John Allen, and it's a wonderful metaphor, but it's actually kind of true. And so we would see fluctuations of CO2 of five to 700 parts per million, because unlike our biosphere, all of, all of Biosphere 2 is illuminated during the day, so photosynthesis ruled, and at night, no photosynthesis, respiration. The great surprise, and I totally endorse what uh, Sir Ian was saying, you learn more. If we knew everything that we needed to know about uh, how biospheres operate, what a, what a waste of time and energy and money and <laughs> to make Biosphere 2. We built it so we would find out what we don't know and what would be unexpected. So oxygen declined. And in all the meetings where we asked people their nightmares, no one ever said, you might start losing your oxygen. And furthermore, it was mysterious because you know we couldn't figure out. This is when Columbia University, who later on uh, came to manage Biosphere 2, got involved. And okay, let's go to biome self-organize rapidly is the first, the first one. Biomass more than doubled during the, the two years. The fog desert began to transition to a more chaparral because we couldn't keep it as, as dry uh, and couldn't control the seasons as well as a natural fog desert. And we decided to let it go that way. The biosphere was teaching us. And some of the biosphere two biomes, and many of them like the marsh and the coral reef, and you're gonna put a rainforest in Southern Arizona? A lot of people thought that, in fact, we couldn't make these things work or they would homogenize into the equivalent of an urban we-dominated system. But I think they underestimated, one, the genius of their ecological designers and the power of the environmental technologies uh, supporting, supporting the uh, different conditions. The Biosphere 2 coral reef, we knew that was gonna be the most challenging, required weeding, tender loving care, chemical buffering that during the two years. And uh, Columbia University used it for some still widely cited landmark papers because they started manipulating CO2 after Biosphere 2 ceased to be a closed system. And those are, you know, they were kind of harbingers of what's happening in our coral reef, our, our global coral reef. And then I have to talk about the personal experience so learning to be a biospherian, and I, I did have a taste of this. We have a test module, and I went into our test module for 24 hours, and it was such a profound experience, you know, in a really small enclosure, you know, you immediately get that you're connected. Every breath, you're connected with this system. And you look around, you can see the plants. So in Biosphere 2, we also said all of these green plants and the ones that we can't quite see in the ocean, they're a third lung. And what's really interesting about the Biospherian experience is that, and, and you know, as I, I've been telling you, I've, I've been involved in ecology. I, I hate the word environment, but that's a, a, for another time. But it was always in my head. And the really dramatic thing that started to happen in the test module and became more and more profound living with a small world that you're in this kind of communion with, metabolic, the metabolic dance, the symphony of the biosphere, is that knowledge goes down into your body. And so, you know, we didn't have to tell the biospherians to be careful, you know. I don't think a plant was unintentionally stepped on during our two years. We understood, I mean, it became synonymous. You know, the biosphere is health, this, this mini biosphere and our health, it's the same thing. If this biosphere gets ill, we're in trouble. So, and I think, I should say, you know, educational outreach was really important. And at the time of Biosphere 2, the word biosphere mostly had to be spelled to people. It was not in common parlance. Sustainability, forget it, maybe a few academics were talking about it, and how the world has changed. So Biosphere 2, we didn't, we didn't know it was going to be a you know, big media and worldwide uh, news event. But you know, we were glad when it happened, and it was kind of like somehow Biosphere 2 touched a nerve. And I think it was a very prophetic experiment, a very inherently optimistic one that humans, technology, anthropogenic biomes 
can be made, we're gonna find out what, what we don't know and what needs to be improved, can be made to mesh with a living system. So they tell me that over a billion people watched the re-entry of the eight of us into the Earth's biosphere after two years. L little vignettes, uh, you know, unlike the right stuff, our management said, you have a rare privilege to be a biospherian, but I don't think we needed that encouragement to celebrate it in poetry, in art, in music, in, in uh, documentary films. And then we had the great pleasure, that's the, uh, the top, the top right-hand side slide for you. That's one of our inter-biospheric arts festivals where we linked up you know, with the technology of the early 90s with either artists, musicians, et cetera, on site or even to Los Angeles and other venues. And you know, so we lived a very varied life. Uh, we did huge amounts of research. We had a calorie restricted diet. I should have said that that farm was calculated by our agricultural advisors to be among the most productive half acres in the world without polluting uh, the rest of the biosphere. But calorie restricted diet uh, was the, the uh, science forte of our doctor Roy Walford inside. So we became the first humans to be studied in that. Oxygen declined, but we were not climbing a mountain. So we did a lot of physiological studies and that's, uh, it kind of illustrates also that in biospheres you can decouple things that in the Earth's environment you may not be able to uncouple. And then the, the great pleasure of, I love that one picture of our plants getting into one of our air handlers. It's like a radiator and it also, produced winds because Biosphere 2 in, in some way was, you know, a progenitor of the Anthropocene and life and technology really intimately meshed inside. And we had parties, we did our home brewing, uh, <laughs> etc. There's a picture of the Galago and, you know, so we were mindful, we took a few uh, bananas that Sir Ian and his team, you know, happily put into, into the rainforest, but we had to leave most of them for the Galagos to eat. And again, you know, so one of the funnest things we did was reaching out to schools. They both came to Biosphere 2 and we linked up with, again, the technology available to us. And countless schools in the United States and around the world would have, and you know, from grade school to middle school to, to universities, you know, Let's have an exercise, design a biosphere. And the great pleasure of trying to tell a seven-year-old, I know you really like elephants, but you know we can't really build a food chain that can support an elephant in a half acre. You know, these kind of important learning experiences. And then the amazing thing of coming out and you know, with the first breath and the first look at the, at the sky outside, it really reinforced to me that we had in fact been living in a different biosphere. The engineering was so good in Biosphere 2 that there was less than 1% air exchange between the two. And I have to show this slide because uh, in 1996, this is two, two years after the second crew uh, that had a closure experiment, we convened one of our meetings of uh, closed ecological systems in biospherics. So in, in that picture, and, and uh, Sir Ian spoke, but I'm sure he had pressing managerial duties or research <laughs> duties at Kew. But anyway, we, we brought together you know, some of the leading scientists from Russia, from Japan, China, the Europeans, NASA, and the Biosphere Institute. And I'm so happy that there is that, that uh, image of Wallace, because this was with two of the pioneers who've done the most advanced work in Siberia under the, the famous uh, portrait of Darwin. So we would have we would have had to like got in the middle there, but it would have been a pleasure. And then uh, as Sir Ian was saying, I was in charge of the sewage system and uh, it was a great job because I could see it was kind of dazzling the people who were coming to see that here's this, cra I'm Jewish, this crazy Yid with a sickle, you know, cutting vegetation. So. We, we had it, and we worked very closely with a NASA pioneer in this field. Our constructed wetland was treating all of the human waste, the laboratory workshop waste, the, the uh, liquid waste from our domestic animals, 
and producing this beautiful ecology. It was a, a haven for, for ladybugs and a couple of our volunteer frogs also, you know, if you have a frog in a system, it will find a wetland. And I totally fell in love with this, this technology because it was so elegant and all of the remaining treated water and nutrients were being added to the irrigation supply. So again, 100 year experiment, we were very diligent about getting all the nutrients back into the soils that were producing our food. And I decided to go back to academia so after doing my PhD at the University of Florida, uh, I started a, a, uh, a company, and I should uh, acknowledge David Torchetto, who is part of the Wastewater Garden International team. And I think we kind of shook up the field because it's mostly dominated by engineers who just do reeds. No, I mean, I'm too ecological, and they're so boring. I mean, monocultures are really boring. So we decided to make systems that would be irresistibly beautiful so that people at hotels and businesses and homes and, and whatever would love to have these systems there. They're, they're designed to where there's no odor. And so we've had the great pleasure of working in 14 countries, a few of the, the illustrative systems. And David is a key component. We have a very ambitious project called Eden in Iraq that's going to do a town, of, of a marsh Arab town in southern Iraq, which has terrible sewage problems that are polluting the wetlands. Uh, so that's in the works when things calm down and we get a donor or two of thunder. So I wrote a book, uh, and you all know Dylan Thomas. So my original title for this book was Holy Shit. My publishers, my publisher said, no, we're not going to publish anything with that four-letter word uh, in it. Uh, but I was also thinking, you know, it could have been titled My Adventures in the Shit Trade. And, you know, so this will be, if you get this book, which I encourage you to do, Synergetic Press is the publisher, will be the funniest book that you ever read about shit. Because when you go around, people either don't know what's happening and I think they're a little afraid to find out what's happening to their caca and doo-doo, or they'll just straight up lie to you, you know, even government officials. So a great deal of the fun of, of being in the shit trade is seeing, you know, kind of doing detective work as to what's happening and then coming up with innovative, low-tech solutions. And what really endears me about constructed wetlands, it, it connects people, you know, to what's happening with their waste. And it's such a beautiful solution, you know. So at the projects we put them in, we say, don't save, you know, don't save going to the bathroom when you get back to the city. You know, use the restaurant's bathrooms because you will be feeding and making happy the plants all around you. So we've continued in closed systems. This is at the uh, Synergia Ranch facility. We built it, we call this the modular biosphere. I think it's also a great educational tool that universities should have. They should also have a mini biosphere. But this gave, and the size of that was, it would fit into the shuttle cargo bay. So it gave us a chance to work with high intensity lights and systems maybe more immediately relevant to space. And I continue, I, I, I chair a session at the International Coast Bar meetings. And so this is kind of a, a gathering of some of the leaders of various bioregenerative life support, including the Chinese. There's two you know, groups in China that are really, really advancing the field. So, you know, both from my biospheric, biospherian experience, and I think one of the legacies of Biosphere 2, which I explore in the book, is what insights does that give to, you know, we're in a pretty much a pickle. I'm, I'm a dogged optimist. I think optimism is a yoga. You should never give in to despair. Because in Biosphere 2, we learned also things, you know, cycles went so fast that there were no anonymous actions and there was no small action. Every action counts. And so, you know, a lot of the lessons, you know, the insights that we had and everybody had, it was a big project. Probably 200 people, 200 scientists, engineers were involved. Uh, that kind of insight, you know, needs to be translated to, as I say, we're running a very dangerous experiment, the sixth extinction, uh, the Anthropocene, 
we need an injection of noospheric thinking, some intelligence. Another shameless uh, uh, plug. Uh, so this is available at the October Gallery, which is a very happening art gallery, very close to Russell Square. And uh, Judy Hawes, known as Chili, has brought 20 copies, so we will be selling them at the reception in the library afterward. And I guess I'll just end with the approaches of ecotechnics and biospherics can, hurt, can help us learn to be, and I think not only sustainable, but actually regenerative. I think, you know, we've, we're passing through the era of destruction, and I can foresee in the noosphere, in an intelligent Anthropocene, that one of our big priorities is to restore the health, diversity, di diversity of the biosphere and to really appreciate, you know, the, the what I was saying about the relationship of the biospherians with the small biosphere, that's literally true of everyone. And even though there isn't a green plant, we're in the Linnaean society and there's not a green plant in this room, but, <laughs> You know, we're breathing and we're breathing and we are in metabolic connection with all the plants and all the animals and all the microbes of planet Earth. And acknowledging that fact, I think, will change our behavior and it will also enrich our lives. Thank you. Thank you.